Good day, everybody. This is Dr. Sanjay Sanyal, Professor Department Chair. This is going to be a demonstration of the muscles and the ligaments on the posterior aspect of the knee with certain special movements which are associated with these ligaments and muscles and also associated structures in the popliteal fossa and the back of the leg. So this is the left knee that you see in front of you. This is the whole femur. This is the left knee joint. And this is the upper part of the leg here on the left side. And we have put for comparison, we have put the right side here. So we shall focus on the left side. So first, let's take a look at the muscles which are attached to the back. Remember, red is the origin, blue is the insertion. So we see this one here. This is the insertion of the adductor tendon. The adductor tendon comes straight from the ischial tuberosity and gets attached to this board here. This is the adductor tubercle. This adductor tubercle is an elevation which you can feel on your medial condyle of a femur. It is in the region of the medial epicondyle. And this is where it gets inserted. It is shown a little away. This is the insertion. So this is the insertion of the adductor tendon, the hamstring component of the adductor magnus. This is the origin of the medial head of the gastrocnemius. The gastrocnemius medial head forms the intromedial boundary of the popliteal fossa. Here we see the origin of the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. And we can see this is the origin of the plantaris. Inside the lateral head of the gastrocnemius, there can be an sesamoid bone which is referred to as the fabella. This is a lateral x-ray of the knee to show the sesamoid bone called fabella within the tendon of origin of the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. We can see another origin below that. This is the, one of the origins of the popliteus muscle. The other origin of the popliteus muscle is from inside the knee joint. There is an opening in the posterior capsule of the knee joint. It takes origin from the posterior limb of the lateral meniscus of the knee. Then we see this blue portion here above solial line. This is the insertion of the popliteus. So therefore the popliteus takes origin from the upper lateral side and it moves down and medially and gets inserted. So therefore, the popliteus muscle and the popliteus fascia covering it forms the floor of the lower part of the popliteal fossa. We see this insertion here. This is the insertion of the semimembranosus muscle. The semimembranosus muscle, as you know, along with the semitendinosus, it forms the supramedial boundary of the popliteal fossa. This semimembranosus has got an extensive expansion. Apart from its main insertion on the back of the upper tibia, it reinforces the posterior capsule of the knee like this. It also gives a ligament called the oblique popliteal ligament, which runs like this. It runs from the medial side up towards the lateral side. That's called the oblique popliteal ligament. It also gives an expansion, which reinforces the popliteus fascia. So these are at least three expansions of the semimembranosus that are very clearly established. Between the insertions of the semimembranosus and the origin of the medial head of the gastrocnemius, there can be a bursa, and that is known as the semimembranosus bursa. Similarly, under the origin of the medial head of the gastrocnemius, there can be a bursa that is known as the gastrocnemius bursa. Both these bursa, as well as the popliteus bursa, which is between the popliteus muscle and the knee joint. In these three bursae, they can communicate with the knee joint. And if they rupture, they can also form a collection in the popliteal fossa, which is referred to as a Morant Baker cyst. This is an MRI of the knee to show a popliteal cyst, also known as a Morant Baker cyst, located in the popliteal fossa. So we have seen the muscles around that region. Now let's take a look at the ligaments. Two most important ligaments are the tibial collateral ligament on the tibial side, that's the medial side, and the fibular collateral ligament, which comes on the lateral side. So first let's take the tibial collateral ligament. The tibial collateral ligament takes origin from the medial epicondyle of the femur. It's a flat band, a tight flat band, and it runs down like this. Here it is fused to the lateral of the knee joint and here it is also attached to the peripheral margin of the medial meniscus and then it gets attached here to the upper medial aspect of the tibia. There can be a bursa between this tibial collateral ligament and the tibia itself and additionally there can be a bursa between the tibial collateral ligament and this insertion of the pes anserinus that is referred to as the anserine bursa. Pes anserinus is the combined insertion of the sartorius, gracilis and semitendinosus. For that I have turned the tibia slightly to show you. So that is the tibial collateral ligament and because it is fused to the peripheral margin of the medial meniscus, the medial meniscus is relatively immobile and that is one of the reasons why medial meniscus tears are much more common than the lateral meniscus tears. Now let's take the other ligament, the fibular collateral ligament. For that I am showing the lateral side. The fibular collateral ligament takes origin from the lateral epicondyle of the femur and it goes down and it gets inserted onto the head of the fibula and as it gets inserted, it splits the insertion of the biceps femoris. And we can see this blue structure here. This is the insertion of the biceps femoris, which incidentally forms the supralateral boundary of the popliteal fossa. And it splits that insertion 
so that the insertion of the biceps femoris forms a U all around the fibular collateral ligament. This fibular collateral ligament is separated from the knee joint and from the lateral meniscus by the popliteus tendon, which I mentioned just a little while back. The fibular collateral ligament, therefore, is not attached to the lateral meniscus. And because the fibular collateral ligament is free from the lateral meniscus, plus the fact that the lateral meniscus also gives partial origin to the popliteus muscle, the lateral meniscus is much less commonly injured during rotation of the knee. Because during rotation of the knee, the lateral meniscus is pulled away by the popliteus and therefore it is prevented from injury. Though it does get injured occasionally as a peripheral tear, but it is much less common than injury of the medial meniscus. There is also an arcuate popliteal ligament. It starts from the head of the fibula, it arches like this upwards and medially, and it forms an opening under which the popliteus muscle emerges. This ligament is supposedly inversely related to the presence, size or the absence of the sesamoid bone which is present inside the lateral head of the gastrocnemius which I mentioned earlier, the fabella. It is postulated that these two structures, ligament as well as the fabella, are concerned with maintaining the posterolateral stability of the knee joint. This is another lateral x-ray of the knee to show fabella and sesamoid bone within the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. Now let's come to a very special movement which is present in the knee and that is the rotation movement. Because everybody understands that the knee is a hinge joint and therefore flexion and extension movement is something which everybody understands. What is poorly understood is that the knee is also capable of rotation. Rotation is defined as rotation of the tibia and that is measured by the direction the second toe is pointing. Usually when the knee is flexed by to 90 degrees, the tibia can rotate 10 degrees medially and it can rotate 30 degrees laterally. When the knee is extended, the tibia can rotate 5 degrees medially. How is this achieved? So let's take a look at the same muscles. Coming back to the muscles in the supramedial boundary of the popliteal fossa, we have the semimembranosus and the semitendinosus. I told you this was the insertion of the semimembranosus and I showed you this was the insertion of the semitendinosus. So these two muscles, the semimembranosus and the semitendinosus are responsible for medial rotation of the tibia by 10 degrees when the knee is flexed to 90 degrees. Similarly, I told you this is the insertion of the biceps femoris to the head of the fibula. And this is responsible for 30 degrees of lateral rotation of the tibia when the knee is flexed to 90 degrees. Now the question is why does the tibia rotate only 10 degrees medially and 30 degrees laterally when the knee is flexed? Here the role of the cruciate ligaments come into play, the anterior and the posterior cruciate ligaments. When the tibia, when the leg is rotating medially, the anterior and the posterior cruciate ligaments, they twist more tightly and so therefore they limit medial rotation and that's the reason why medial rotation is only 10 degrees. And when the leg is laterally rotated, these ligaments untwist and therefore lateral rotation is to a greater extent. That brings us to the other roles of the popliteus itself. One role of the popliteus, I have already told you, is to move the lateral meniscus away during rotation and therefore prevent it from injury. The popliteus also plays a role in rotation of the tibia. It helps to lock the knee when standing and in this it is helped by the cruciate ligaments. The popliteus also helps to unlock the knee the extended knee before flexion so that we can sit down and this again there are two aspects to this when the leg is touching the ground that is referred to as a closed kinetic chain in such a situation obviously the tibia cannot rotate in such a situation the popliteus rotates the femur five degrees laterally on the other hand when the leg is lifted away from the ground that is called the open kinetic chain in such a situation the popliteus rotates the tibia five degrees medially so the popliteus acts on the knee to rotate the leg only when the knee is fully extended. And you may have heard of the childhood prank where a person is standing straight and you tap him from behind and he falls down. It is because you are stimulating the popliteus muscle and therefore causing the popliteus muscle to unlock the knee by rotating the femur and therefore he falls down. The knee flexes involuntarily. So these are the tendons, the muscles, the ligaments and the movements which are possible on the back of the knee. More will follow when I come further lower down and show you the back of the leg. Thank you very much for watching. Dr. Sanjay Sanyal signing out. Please like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day.